Welcome back. Thanks so much for joining us for another Facebook Live Monday. Um, I'm Dr. Susan Bobel. I am the uh, System Chief of Breast Surgical Oncology and Breast Program for Nuvance Health. And I have the, uh, I'm very honored today, Dr. Curcio, to have you join us. Dr. Curcio joined Nuvance Health as a breast surgical oncologist about a year ago. Is that it? That's correct. Uh, One year we ago. Were fortunate enough to recruit her from sunny Southern California. And uh, we are very grateful and the community is grateful to have you here. Um, I thought today we would talk about risk factors for breast cancer. And are there any risk factors that we can modify that are really in our control? So, you know, I think that it's important to talk about, we hear all the time, if your average risk, get a mammogram starting at 40 and every year after that. What really is average risk? What does that mean? I always question whether the average risk woman really exists, but average risk is for breast cancer, one out of eight women are about 13% risk throughout their lifetime. What we define as average risk is someone who does not have the risk factors that have been identified um, to be associated with breast cancer. Uh, and some of those risk factors include never having had a live birth or having your first child after the age of 35. Having wait a second, wait, 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 wait. So if I have not had biological children or had my kid, my biological kids after 35, I'm not at average risk? Correct. So I'm automatically at increased risk. You're not at increased risk. So we define increased risk, since the average risk for women is 13%, we identify increased risk at 20% or higher. So there are lots of factors that can increase your risk, but some of them minimally. So maybe go from 13 to 15%. Um, but if you have a combination of these factors, your risk can go as high as 20%, and then you would be um, included in the increased risk category. So how do I determine my risk? So there are statistical models available. And for um, the average person, it's best to go talk to your physician, whether that is your primary care doctor or uh, your OBGYN, and discuss whether or not you're at increased risk. Um, and they can do um, put your uh, actual factors that we consider to be related to risk into a model that can give them a number. And if you're at the 20% or higher risk, then they can refer a patient to someone like ourselves, a breast specialist, who can then discuss what, what that risk actually means and things that we can do to lower that risk. So if I'm concerned and I think I might be at increased risk, can I just come see you? Do I have sure. to be you, referred? You could directly come to see me. There are some patients that think they're at increased risk and then we actually go over their family history, some of the risk factors, and we find out that they're really not at increased risk. But a lot of patients that self-refer to us are at increased risk. And a lot of that is uh, for well-known risk factors like family history. So what are the top risk factors? So obviously family history is a very um, big risk factor, uh, as well as having a biopsy that shows atypical cells is another risk factor. Um, then there are kind of more minor risk factors, like I mentioned, never having children, having your first life birth after age 35, and when you say having children, you mean biological children carrying biological. that child. Exactly. Giving having a birth, life. it's not having children. Right. People get children lots of ways. This is true. And um, what's underappreciated is starting your periods very young, um, like for instance, less than 12, or stopping your periods, going into menopause later after 55 are also risk factors for breast cancer. So when we talk about the top risk factors, I always think that they're not in our control. Being a woman, getting older, and family history. And we touched on family history, but isn't that only significant if you have a family history? Otherwise, isn't that about average risk? 
I'm not understanding your question. So, so, so women come in frequently, you know, in their 60s, and they've never had a mammogram. And I say, well, you haven't had a mammogram. Is there a reason? Oh, no one in my family has breast cancer. So I don't have a family history of it. So I won't get it. So does that mean you're at average risk if you don't have a family history? No, there are other risk factors that can play a role. And 75% um, of the patients we diagnose with breast cancer do not have a family history. Family history is only a small percentage of breast cancer. So I think of it as family history is only significant if you have one. If Correct. you don't, you're sort of back in the average category depending on your other risk factors. But you're very correct. A lot of people just look at that single factor and then say, oh, I don't have a family history, so I don't need to worry about this. But when we do a really thorough history of other potential risk factors, then we find out that they are at increased risk. Right. So it's important to look at the overall picture. Exactly. What about, and we hear a lot about dense breast tissue. How does that affect risk? So it is known that dense breast tissue is an increased risk for breast cancer, particularly women who go into menopause and keep their dense breast tissue, because a lot of women, after they go into menopause, their breast becomes more um, less dense and more fatty replaced. So we're not quite sure if it's a factor of there's more active tissue as they get older when that tissue should be more in a dormant state, or if it's, it's more difficult to identify cancers in women who are dense breast. But we know as an individual risk factor, it is associated with an elevated risk. So um, can we just explain for the audience what really is dense breast tissue and what does it mean? So it's actually, uh, it's interesting because you can examine someone and their breasts feel dense, but then you actually do a mammogram and their breasts are not dense. So density is really related to the mammography finding. And breast tissue is composed of two main elements. It's breast tissue and the connective tissue around the breast tissue. And the connective tissue, when we're young, is more dense like the breast tissue. Um, so when we get a mammogram, those both those elements are pretty white or bright on a mammogram. But as we get older, um, the, the connective tissue becomes more like fat, so it's darker on a mammogram. So that makes um, the breast tissue more um, visible and able to see things that show up on, in the breast tissue that perhaps are concerning that need to be biopsied. As women get older then, their breast tissue gets more fatty. So um, that's a less dense breast tissue um, as they get older. When the breast is mostly fatty replaced, those are the most mammographically um, sensitive breasts to image. So, and, and that clears up a lot of uh, thoughts out there about dense breast tissue. We hear about it all the time and it is talked about more because it, I, it has been recognized only probably in the past several years that it's a minor risk factor for breast cancer. Correct. And I know in the early 2000s, you'd say a woman has dense breasts and move on. You wouldn't get additional imaging, wouldn't talk about risk factors or anything. So one of the ways that the diagnosis of breast cancer has changed. Correct. So, one of the questions just came in, what about genetic mutations, specifically BRCA1 or BRCA2? Or how does that affect risk? And well, is it a common that, thing? That usually goes with um, a family history, obviously. So when we identify a patient that has multiple first and second degree relatives um, with breast cancer, or other cancers, perhaps ovarian cancer or less commonly pancreatic cancer, then we start thinking that there might be a genetic predisposition. So in those patients, when we do a risk assessment and we identify that the risk is high enough, we actually recommend genetic testing. So we all have the BRCA1 and 2 gene. These are genes that are responsible for preventing cancers from occurring. But when we actually inherit a copy of that gene that is broken, that's when we are at much higher risk to go on and develop breast cancer. The BRCA1 and 2 genes were the first genes that were identified to be associated with hereditary breast cancer. 
So are a lot of breast cancers associated with this? Is it most breast cancers? It's only about five to 10% of all breast cancers are found to be genetic. And how do I know, should, should I get tested? Should everyone get tested? How do we know that? That's a you great know, who question. Who should get tested? So certainly people with a strong history of first and second degree relatives with breast cancer. Other red flags to consider is a family history of ovarian cancer. Um, or an early onset cancer. And we consider early onset in the premenopausal years, particularly in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, also a family history of bilateral breast cancer would make someone think about a, perhaps a hereditary predisposition. And I know that there's some, some talk about being Jewish and higher risk of a genetic mutation um, not practicing Judaism, but being of Jewish descent and Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Can you talk about that a little bit? Correct. Ashkenazi Jewish women have a higher risk of having a BRCA1 one or two mutation um, if they have a family history than someone who is of non-Ashkenazi um, heritage. So you talk about family history with this. Let's say a woman's diagnosed with breast cancer. She doesn't have anyone in her family with it. Should she get, should she have a genetic test? And how do you go about, what is being, having a genetic test really mean? How do you do it? Is it complicated? So in general, um, you have to see a physician for the most part to get genetic testing. Um, and we're not recommending mass genetic testing for any woman to identify if they have a mutation. But if you're identified to have a history that might be consistent with a hereditary cancer um, in the office, we can actually uh, do genetic testing and it's either through a blood draw or a saliva test. Um, there are several labs that particularly do genetic testing for cancer genes that we use, and it usually takes about two to three weeks to get test results after we send in the sample. Okay, and what sort of information, why would I want that? Well, we know that women who have a genetic mutation have a higher risk than someone with a family history without a genetic mutation. And a lot of the genetic mutations that we've identified, we can actually give a range of numbers of what their actual lifetime risk is to develop breast cancer. Some of these mutations are also associated with other cancers. So we might recommend surveillance at an earlier age uh, or surveillance of other organs uh, to make sure that that if they do develop a cancer in that organ, it's identified at its earliest possible stages. Okay, I digressed a little bit into genetic mutations just because it's, it's so interesting. But the important thing is about genetic mutations also is it's important information for the patient herself or himself, but very important for their family. And can you talk about that a little bit? Correct. If you're identified with a genetic mutation, it's very important that other family members, uh, first and second degree relatives know, because um, obviously once we can identify what side of the family we think that that mutation is coming from, hopefully based on the family history, we can um, uh, really give that information to family members and they can be tested so that uh, we can follow those women more closely and be able to diagnose a cancer at a much earlier stage than we would otherwise if they had started screening at a normal um, age of 40. So I think the other, go ahead. No, you said that followed those women. Can men get breast cancer? They can. Um, and particularly with the BRCA1 and 2 mutation, there is a higher risk of male breast cancer associated with those mutations. And so um, we would also recommend if if there is any BRCA1 or 2 mutation to um, consider genetic testing of the males because they also are at higher risk for prostate cancer, which is more common than the male breast cancer with the BRCA1 and 2 mutation and be examining their breast and uh, be proactive with their breast exam, which most men are usually not. Right, and I think that people don't realize that about 1% of all breast cancer diagnosis occur in men. So, so it, it is a real thing. Um, a few questions are coming across. You, you talk about menopause and you use the term. 
what is menopause really? And once someone goes through menopause, are they always in menopause? What, is it, what does it mean? So menopause is actually, in the premenopausal period, the ovaries are the primary source of estrogen. Uh, menopause is when the ovaries essentially go into a dormancy stage and stop making estrogen. So the definition of menopause is one year without a menstrual cycle. So anyone who um, actually say goes two years without a menstrual cycle and then has bleeding, that's considered abnormal uh, bleeding and needs to be worked up for a possibility of something with the uterus and is not, you go back into pre-menopause. Once it's been a year, you are considered menopausal. Okay. And why is this important? The question came in and it's an interesting question. Um, we talk about this because it's what we do every day. Why is it important at what age you get your period and what age you stop your period? Meaning what's the influence of hormones on this? Well, because it's a longer period of time that our breasts are exposed to these higher level of hormones. If you have your period start at age nine and then they don't stop, say, till 58, that's a much longer period of time that our breasts are exposed to those premenopausal hormone levels. And that's been shown to be a risk factor for breast cancer. And what's the average age of menopause? You mentioned 58 is late, but what's the average age of menopause? The about? average age is about 50 to 52. Okay. So if older than that, meaning your, your breasts are exposed to a higher level of hormones, not great. Correct. Okay. Is there something that you can do about that? And I think it comes, it comes back to, if that's an increase, if longer exposure of the breast tissue to hormones, increases our risk, what's the role of hormone replacement? That's a very good question because there are oh, a lot of people that there's a lot of people that think, well, I'm taking bioidenticals and so that shouldn't increase my breast cancer risk. But we see, as we can see from what we just discussed, that our own endogenous hormones, which nothing can be closer to um, natural than our own hormones increases risk, certainly exogenous hormones. And that was shown in the large uh, WHO study that actually showed that women that were on combination hormone therapy, that is estrogen plus progesterone, over seven years were at 30% higher risk to go on and develop breast cancer. Wow. And does that, let's say someone stops after seven years, does that risk remain? That risk remains, but it does go down over time, but it, uh, there is still an elevated risk having taken uh, over seven years of hormone therapy. So you mentioned combined estrogen progesterone. Are there any other types of hormone replacement? Well, in women who've had a hysterectomy, it's not uncommon for them just to go on estrogen alone. And that large trial did not show that women who are on estrogen alone were at increased risk. So that's a safer way to do it, but your uterus has had to be removed in order to do that. Correct, because if we put women on estrogen alone, we can increase the risk of uterine cancer. So lots of women talk about um, symptoms during menopause and it really affects their quality of life and that's why they go on hormone replacement. Is there a safe amount of time? If you said seven years, can I take hormone replacement and stop it at six and a half years and be okay? Or is it a cumulative? So I think uh, there's no textbook answer for that question. I, I do think you have to look at other risk factors. For instance, if I have a woman that's at increased risk, she has say a, a significant family history, but there's no mutations in the family. Um, and maybe she's had a biopsy um, that shows atypical cells. I would not recommend any level of hormone therapy for that patient. I would try to treat her menopausal symptoms without hormone therapy. But someone who has no risk factors that's really having um, significant and I would say life altering um, symptoms. And for some women, it is that significant. I think a short course, but going on it with kind of a game plan, we're going to try to wean off within two years or three years. I really think the least amount of time that they're exposed is, um, is the best and, and uh, provides the, less, the least amount of increased risk.
Yeah, I mean, women can really, certainly not all, but but some women really suffer from menopausal symptoms. And Correct. It doesn't, some women 10, 15, 20 years into menopause are still having symptoms. This is so true, yeah. Are there any things that they can do outside of hormone replacement to help with those symptoms? Um, we have a lot of things that we can actually do. Uh, for instance, Effexor, which is a uh, antidepressant, um, has, has actually been shown to have um, modest uh, improvement in um, hot flashes, if that's the primary symptom. Um, and it's actually been shown to be about 60% effective in women. Sometimes we start off at the lowest dose. We sometimes have to go up sequentially to a dose that controls the symptoms, but that's certainly um, a good choice. Um, Neurontin or gabapentin has been associated with the reduction in um, hot flashes also. Um, and uh, Sometimes though, I find that the side effect profile of that medication prohibits getting to levels that really control the symptoms. One of, I think the best symptoms for hot flashes is actually a catapress patch, lowest doses. Catapress patch is used to treat hypertension, but actually is extremely effective in hot flashes. Uh, but it has to be a patient that has either a normal or a higher blood pressure. People who have lower level blood pressures don't tolerate it. And then, you know, hot flashes isn't the only symptoms. There are symptoms right. um, of uh, vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse. Um, there are non-hormonal treatments for that too that we discuss with our patients. Um, but sometimes um, uh, we're left in a situation where, again, it's life altering and we have to discuss maybe low level um, uh, topical creams to treat their, um, their symptoms. It sounds like one of the messages that you're saying is you have to speak, you have to talk about it. You Correct. have to bring it up to your physician so that it can be discussed. And, and that's a great use of a visit with a primary care doctor or gynecologist in your yearly exams. I mean, if Correct. we don't, if as physicians, we don't know that you're having these symptoms, we can't talk about how to take care of them because we don't know they exist. So I, I think that's a big take home message. Let's talk about some of the risk factors that are in our control and what we call modifiable. We can change them. What would you say are the biggest modifiable risk factors for breast cancer? Well, actually the one that we just discussed, right? The hormone therapy, if we can avoid it, that's definitely a modifiable uh, risk factor. Um, we do know that there is a correlation with weight and breast cancer risk. So being at a healthy uh, body weight for our height is uh, a modifiable risk factor. Um, regular exercise. Before you go on, why is that? I well, always think if I understand the why, I'm more apt to follow it. So why is that? So it's interesting because initially we thought that being overweight is directly correlated with higher estrogen levels, which is correlated with risk. And there is a higher estrogen level, but there are a couple other um, theories about um, unhealthy estrogen in someone who's overweight um, and more inflammation because um, being overweight is associated with insulin resistance, which is in so associated with an inflammatory state. And we know that cancers can occur more readily in people that have high levels of inflammation. So it's kind of a complex relationship. It's not a one-to-one -one. being overweight is just a higher estrogen, but it's different types of estrogen and more inflammation. So I read that and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that the BMI or our height and weight ratio, not the per not a perfect measurement, but you know, it sort of allows it to be standardized, is much more significant as a risk factor, higher BMIs when you are menopausal. That's correct. That's correct. And so if I'm overweight and still getting my period, it's okay with risk no, for breast cancer. No, 
uh, we do know that being overweight um, in premenopausal years is, is also a risk factor, but not as heavily as being overweight in menopause. And we do know statistically going into menopause, if you're already overweight, many women gain between the average is 10 to 20 pounds with menopause because of the hormonal changes. So it definitely can be associated if you're already at increased weight um, with a significant increase in uh, breast cancer risk too. 10 to 20 pounds, that's significant. That is significant. Wow. That's the average. In over what time period? Well, it just depends. Some women, um, I don't think it has to do so much with uh, how long it takes you to have menopausal symptoms and to be a year without a period. It probably is the five to 10 years after set menopausal symptoms start that period of time um, that the average woman gains 10 to 20 pounds. That's a, that's a significant weight gain and can definitely make a change in your BMI. Correct. Um, other modifiable risk factors? Uh, other modifiable risk factors are exercise. Um, again, exercise is uh, felt to be associated with healthier estrogen levels. And so being active at least 30 minutes, at least five days a week is associated with the reduced risk of breast cancer. So if I, you know, we have busy work schedules, kids, busy lives. If I can't fit in five days a week and I only do it three days a week, does that mean I'm not getting a benefit or... No, that, that means you are getting a benefit. You're just not getting the optimal benefit. I think any exercise is better than no exercise for sure. So it's interesting. Studies show that being overweight increases our risk of at least 13 different cancers, Correct. not just breast, um, specifically breast and definitely colon, uh, which are the two cancers, two of the cancers that we actually have great screening tests for but definitely increases the risk. And exercise decreases the risk for breast and colon, has been yes. shown in studies. So that's an interesting thing. What and there's a very high association with colon cancer, uh, sedentary lifestyles and colon cancer and being at higher risk, much higher risk. So it's not just that exercise reduces it, but being sedentary increases the risk. Right. And uh, what about the risk factor that people don't really like hearing about? Alcohol. Alcohol. Intake. How does that affect it? We just have so, a minute left. So certainly drinking daily. Um, is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. And it doesn't matter where, whether it's beer, wine, or hard liquor. And drinking three drinks a day increases the risk of uh, three times that. So they say the number is one drink a day, every day is 10% increased risk, three drinks a day, doesn't matter what type, 30% increased risk. I mean, that, again, significant decreases. So you know, the good thing about this take home message is there are certain risk factors that we can modify. The major risk factors being a woman, getting older, and your family history, but only if you have a family history. If you don't, you're still at average risk yes. or more. So many risk factors we cannot modify, but we certainly do have some things in our control. So I, I look at that as the, our take home messages. And that's not just for breast cancer, but just for overall good health. You know, we still do want to concentrate on overall wellness and health. So thank you, Dr. Curcio, so much for joining us. And really, if you have questions, please contact your primary care doctor or GYN, but, but bring these questions, bring your issues to our attention as your physicians, because if we don't know it's an issue, we, we can't really take care of it. So that's really a very important message here. But thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to other Facebook Live series. Thank you so much.